Let me uh, pause to add that, you know, every one of you are leaders in your own right and can lead from the significant position that you hold and the role you play um, in the field of adult education. So, as I've said before, these eight key matters not, are not intended to be an all-inclusive list of everything you'll need to know uh, in order to succeed as a, as a leader. Um, today, we'll wrap up with uh, the final three, customer service, access, and partnership matters. So, customer service matters, I, I would say here, don't ever underestimate how customer service matters to our partners, our employers, and most importantly, our students. You know, first impressions are, are lasting impressions and I always like to think about, you know, is, is your center age appropriate? You know, college students like to hang out and study in big comfortable chairs with Wi-Fi and uh, I'll, I'll, typically referred to that as a Starbucks-like environment. So we should want the same attractive venues and settings uh, for our local centers uh, as we do uh, for college students. So we wanna be in attractive uh, age appropriate settings. Uh, unfortunately, uh, years ago, and some of you may remember, it seems like adult ed programs may have been in classrooms with, uh, I used to say, with little chairs and Barney and Big Bird on the wall. Um, and those just aren't uh, age appropriate that are, are, are attractive and engaging environments uh, for the adults we're trying to reach. Sort of goes back to my previous illustration of a program located on a community college campus where uh, I found students would simply say, I go to the community college and, and they leave it at that. So the other thing is, uh, you know, first impressions, all staff from the, the receptionist to the program director to instructors to college and career navigators must adopt that, what I call an impeccable customer service culture. Um, uh, many of you are probably familiar and could name many employers uh, that, that have that, uh, but that culture like uh, Chick-fil-A, Amazon, Toyota, uh, Starbucks, uh, and our sponsor and friends uh, from, from Aztec. So we know that uh, our students struggle to manage life's curveballs thrown their way. Um, so it uh, says here from a, a, a book I read, uh, The Starbucks Experience, you know, five ways of being to be welcoming, genuine, considerate, knowledgeable, and be involved with our students. You know, for example, you, you all know if, if our students, if they have a flat tire, we don't see them for weeks. Whereas most of us are able to get it fixed and just be late to work that morning. So we have to recognize uh, our students need to quickly rebuild their lives. Uh, and that's why, uh, as we talked earlier, uh, with program development matters, teacher quality and effectiveness is critically important. Uh, we must have instructors in our programs who can take our students further, faster, um, accelerated programs. We have to offer those that help our students get back to the workforce or, or on to post-secondary education. Um, they have uh, uh, families to feed often and need to be able to uh, to, to move forward uh, with their careers and employment. You know, some states, uh, as it points there, provide wraparound support services. Many states, many of you today, have hired college and career navigators. And this is because we know our students often lack an adult or parent uh, in their lives to help them navigate the maze of college entrance forms or student financial aid. And these college and career navigators are critically important uh, to, to support our students. We deployed those uh, several years back uh, in Kentucky, and we, we want them knowledgeable also of labor market information to be able to coach and counsel our students uh, about particular job uh, information. Uh, that they may be looking at for the future. So, you know, at the end of the day, 
Uh, this is a great quote from Maya Angelou. They may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. So these are uh, two excellent reads, along with uh, the book I mentioned earlier, The Starbucks Experience. And these are great books on, uh, again, what I describe as impeccable customer service. And um, I would encourage you to begin building a leadership library of resources like these. The Fred Factor talks about uh, just a, a postman that, that had extraordinary customer service uh, for uh, the, the folks that he delivered mail to. Um, and then the other book, How Full Is Your Bucket? It talks about how uh, we uh, should make every effort to pour into individuals' bucket rather than uh, dip out of their bucket. So access matters. In today's environment, creating convenience and access may be one of the most critical elements of a strategic plan uh, that you develop. So as you think about access matters, um, think about how you reconfigure your service hours to be convenient uh, for your students rather than staff. Um, you know, for far too long, we've uh, built it around uh, convenience uh, for folks that said, well, I've always just taught from eight till three. Uh, well, maybe our students, um, our customers need services from three to eight. Um, maybe they need, uh, you know, uh, support or programs offered uh, on the weekends. Um, I recall uh, a conversation with one state um, several years ago that adopted uh, what they called sort of a hub um, uh, skills centers. Um, they found that uh, they tried sort of the model of being accessible on um, every street corner, if you will, for a couple hours here and a couple hours there, only to find that the couple hours that they were in one area uh, happened to be the couple of hours that uh, uh, moms took their kids to school and then uh, they spent a couple hours working at the local McDonald's. So while they were there, it wasn't the right time to be there. So they began looking at consolidating. Um, and, you know, this is probably a, an area of uh, efficiency, financial efficiency as well, but consolidated into hub centers that were open 12 to 18 hours. And then students figured out the convenient times for them uh, to, to get there to those centers. So uh, just uh, something to, to think about as you look at uh, the importance of creating uh, greater access for our students. You know, unfortunately, how many of our classrooms or how many of your classrooms have begun to look like this um, uh, even prior to COVID? Um, you know, and uh, prior to COVID, uh, on, on any given day, my boss, our, our cabinet secretary, would come to our leadership meetings and and report there were, I think, 125 job openings. And, uh, but there were only 20,000 uh, job seekers. Uh, so the point being is um, we had a lot of opportunity there um, to um, the, anybody that wanted to work uh, was able to work. So therefore they weren't coming um, to our program. So we were seeing classrooms um, that looked uh, quite empty, rather than uh, what you'd prefer to see, which is a, a full complement of, of students, uh, as you see here. So I began asking the question uh, to our programs, uh, what if you were a restaurant owner? And instead of looking um, like this, where you had a uh, full uh, restaurant of folks dining with you, what if your restaurant looked like this and no one was coming to, to dine with you? Um, and usually the response I would get, uh, they would all say, well, I guess we'll go out of business. And uh, my response was, well, uh, maybe not. Let's think of some other options. You know, how do you uh, reinvent yourself? How do you think differently? Um, 
where convenience uh, may be uh, important to those uh, that are seeking our services. So I got them to think about uh, just an, using a, an analogy of, you know, so in many large cities, you know, where do folks go for lunch? They don't get uh, in their cars and drive out to the suburbs for, for lunch. They simply walk out of their office buildings downtown and they go to what we see uh, very frequently today, food trucks. So just uh, trying to plant uh, a little seed of innovation there, you know, maybe uh, we could get Kentucky Skills U food trucks. Um, I said that with a little bit of jest, but yet recognizing it was just to spur uh, some innovative, you know, transformative thought. How could we get creative to create greater access points for our students? You know, again, um, as I said earlier, prior to COVID, our, our enrollment was already pretty anemic. Um, so we began thinking about, you know, how do we um, look at where we relocate our services to meet students where they are? So we launched this idea around uh, Kentucky Skills U connection points um, and encouraged our programs uh, to locate at, at libraries or uh, Department for Community-Based Services um, local offices. So we uh, understood that, that libraries uh, really served as, as a non-threatening venue uh, for our adults. Um, and uh, there's also a lot of activities for kids there uh, that may occupy them while the adults uh, uh, jump online uh, on a computer program there at the library. So we also knew that, uh, that our Department for Community-Based Services uh, had a significant traffic flow of individuals uh, that most likely uh, like the high school equivalency is why they were uh, in need of those services. So connection points is something, and, and we um, ask our programs to deploy their uh, college and career navigators there, maybe a couple times a week uh, uh, with scheduled hours to do uh, intake orientation assessment, connecting our students um, uh, to our local program. Uh, or, as I said earlier, to be able to access uh, instruction there uh, using software programs. So the other thing uh, we were looking at as a strategy that um, maybe our sign out front needed to say Kentucky Skills U has left the building. Um, again, we weren't finding students coming to us. so. Uh, how do we figure out where to go, uh, where cohorts naturally exist? Um, and, and we just can't always expect those cohorts of students to come to us. We've, uh, we've clung to the drop-in model uh, for far too long. Um, so sometimes we just need to step away from our comfort zone and, and try new things. You know, I, I used to say, uh, you know, our adult ed programs were sort of like, um, Motel 6 system, we leave the lights on and hope people show up and they're not showing up. So how do we go to them? How do we um, build effective partnerships with employers? Uh, go to the workplace um, because most aren't going to come to our programs at the end of, uh, of a long work day, uh, but they may participate sometime before, after, uh, during lunch. Uh, if we're there at the work site, convenient, accessible uh, for them. So another way to uh, enhance uh, access uh, for our students is uh, develop a technology-based strategy. Uh, I, I call it clicks versus bricks, uh, but also recognizing that our students uh, aren't University of Phoenix type students. Uh, we can't just simply hand them a password to a software program and uh, send them on their way to uh, come back and say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm ready to take the uh, high school equivalency test now. 
so our students require uh, high touch with high tech. So keep that in mind uh, as you develop uh, a clicks versus bricks strategy. Um, we also found that that uh, providing uh, hardware technology as well to our students, uh, computer suitcases with uh, hot spots in them uh, might be a good strategy. And we just know that, uh, you know, for, for years we've talked about uh, the importance of, of the technology strategy for distance learning, particularly for, uh, you know, single moms who, you know, oftentimes can log on and learn at night after they put the kids to bed. Uh, so, again, uh, there's many different ways to think about uh, increasing uh, access for our students. And then the other point there, resources uh, for auxiliary uh, needs may be a, the, one of the biggest barriers to our students uh, even engaging with us. Um, you know, access may not matter if our students don't get the encouragement and supports they need. Um, and, and particularly found that to be true um, as you develop uh, IET programs uh, where students were often uh, interested in participating, um, uh, but found that sometimes they uh, struggled when it came to the um, the uh, technical aspect of the model, uh, where it required that they purchase tuition, pay tuition, purchase books or tools. Um, and I've always used a sort of a, a welding program as an example where. And say I'd like to be a welder, but I just can't afford the boots and goggles and uh, helmet to to be a welder or a uh, plumber or electrician. I can't afford uh, the the tools it requires to even enroll in that program. So think about the importance of those resources needed uh, for our students uh, to be able to succeed. And finally, uh, partnership matters. Uh, the building relationships with uh, key partners, agencies, employers uh, is critically important uh, in today's world. And in order to develop partnerships, it's important to build relationships uh, with colleagues and other organizations, you know, preferably those that are at common organizational and decision-making levels. What I found to be most beneficial is to get FaceTime over an early morning uh, coffee meeting or lunch. Uh, and, and this enables you to build the relationship in a more personal way. Um, I had a, a colleague that was a, a deputy secretary, another a, a commissioner in another agency that we regularly scheduled uh, early morning coffee meetings to catch up. And um, those are two individuals um, I still connect with today, um, even though we're in uh, different roles now, uh, just because we built really great relationships uh, and it enabled us to, to work together uh, really well. And then uh, as you collaborate with uh, partners and employers and folks in the, the WEOA community, be responsive to the objectives and, and goals that other uh, partners and organiza organizations need to accomplish. You know, it's, it, it's important uh, as you plant those partnership seeds to cultivate and grow those relationships in a, what I call a mutually beneficial way um, that will lead to results uh, for all the parties involved. And then a couple, you'll see the in the graphics there, a couple partners that, that we developed were uh, with a uh, Appalachian Regional Healthcare that uh, has uh, hospitals across Eastern Kentucky in particular, and said, "Hey, could you offer your programming on site um, uh, at our hospitals? Um, you know, we have folks that are in entry-level positions. That if we could establish a, a career pathway opportunity for them, uh, many of them, uh, you know, working in entry-level positions." that we hired the, and they lacked the high school equivalency. So if you could come on site and help us uh, help them achieve an HSE that maybe we could put them on a career pathway uh, to advance. 
And then uh, the other one you see there um, was uh, with uh, Kentucky AARP. And as you'll see, there's a, a trifold that they uh, put together as a result of the partnership we developed. And this goes back to, as I talked about in one of the earlier sessions, where uh, nearly 50% of our target population uh, ages 45 to 64. And so um, uh, some folks from the graduate network and ARP um, had heard me speak and uh, heard that data point. And uh, they came back and said, um, hey, that's right in our sweet spot. You know, how can we help you um, uh, reach that audience? And um, so partnering with them developed an initiative called Come Back Kentucky. And uh, uh, little did I know they enlisted um, and what they call ARP ambassadors uh, in different communities to do outreach. And um, so we did a, web, a webinar uh, for them just to help them understand uh, some of the data and challenges um, in the field of adult education. So, and finally, one of our best uh, partnerships was with the Kentucky Community and Technical College System. Uh, Kentucky happened to be one of the states selected several years ago to participate uh, in the Accelerating uh, Opportunity Initiative uh, uh, modeled after uh, Washington State's IBEST program. And so uh, it was a great partnership um, uh, that we uh, at one point rebranded uh, with this idea uh, around GED Plus. Uh, and we were able to kick this off with uh, uh, our governor and uh, president of our uh, community college system and myself um, in the uh, Capitol Rotunda with, with our governor. Um, so this uh, particular uh, partnership um, is uh, best described in this quick video I'm going to share. For some people, the high school to college to work path just doesn't happen. It's in a way. We get it. We also know that if you don't have a high school degree or GED, it can be really hard to find a good job. And you can forget actually finding a career that you care about. That pays enough to make it worth it. Here's the thing. Many employers these days require a high school degree and even some college. Believe it or not, a lot of jobs in Kentucky are going unfilled because we don't have enough people with the right credit. Kentucky needs you, and you need a little bit more education. That's why we developed GED+. It's a program that helps you get your GED plus a college credit and get a head start on a great career. In about four months, you can complete your GED and a certificate in one of five areas. These five areas are industries that are experiencing shortages in skilled labor. So we know we can connect you to a good job in your area when you're finished. Oh, and did we mention, this is all tuition free. So to recap, here's why now might be the time for you to get started on a better life. Get your GED plus a college certificate plus a career that you love minus a whole lot of money. Contact your personal advisor now at gedpluskey.org. First. So here's your uh, homework for the day. Think about what are some key partnerships you've developed and, and what are new relationships and partnerships that could be cultivated uh, for the future? So to summarize um, this three part series, these leadership matters, again, comprise the lessons I've learned um, over my career in this arena. Uh, again, they're not intended to be an all inclusive list of everything you'll need to know as a leader. However, they capture many of the in innovative and transformative strategic planning efforts that we moved forward uh, in Kentucky. You know, as part of this, we plan with a, a mindset of change, not just necessarily change for change sake, but to be student-centric and results-focused. 
as I said in, in part one, leadership growth and development doesn't happen with one class, one webinar, one conference, one training institute. However, our objective during these three sessions was to lay a foundation uh, for you to build on uh, with these eight key pillars. You know, we all play a key role in achieving success. You know, whether it's at the state level, we work to develop partnerships and initiatives that will uh, provide opportunities uh, for our students. At the local level, you're the hands and feet that directly influence the outcomes uh, that our students are able to achieve. We know if all members of the team point the arrow of success towards a common purpose and common goals, you can achieve uh, mission possible. So in summary, here's a couple more books uh, from my leadership library. Uh, from uh, Captain Michael Abershoff. Uh, he's the former commander of the USS Benfold. And he describes uh, in these two books how he led the performance improvement uh, of, these, uh, of his ship by creating a crew of confident, inspired problem solvers, uh, eager to take initiative and take responsibility for their actions. And as a result, the slogans on board uh, became, it's your ship, it's our ship. So I would challenge you to take ownership and leadership as the captains uh, of your programs. And uh, after all, it's your ship. So we must turn to the future and what does that look like? Uh, you know, how do we transform our nation's adult ed system? Uh, and we do that through having uh, a sense of urgency. Uh, I, I like to call being responsive uh, to our students, partners, employers, and flexible and nimble in our service delivery. And, um, you know, I began using the phrase flexible, nimble, and responsive as a key way to describe this. So as you've seen um, from my four R's that we talked about earlier, I like to use alliterations. So I'll conclude uh, this series with what I call my P's to success. And that's when Positive people with passion form partnerships with a common purpose. It paves the pathway for progress. And that concludes uh, today's session. And I thank you for uh, your time and attention over these uh, last three sessions. Thanks, Reese. We had just uh, two questions that came through. One of them was earlier on in your presentation, and it was about expanding programs. And so uh, the person stated that they would really like to offer different classes at various sites, but they have limited staff, and we're wondering if you had any suggestions. So um, again, it, it goes back to um, using staff, thinking in, in different ways of uh, particularly if you have uh, multiple program satellite sites uh, that you may use staff as uh, sort of what I referred to earlier as circuit riders, that they may teach in uh, uh, one program for a couple hours uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, maybe Monday and Wednesdays they teach at another location. Um, so uh, again, it's thinking flexibly that staff may not just be at the same facility location for eight hour days, um, but, but move around. Uh, and, and also the importance of serving a, a full complement of students, expecting maybe students to um, enroll for a particular class um, with the expectation uh, that they uh, attend regularly uh, to make it more efficient. That makes sense. And then the other question um, started out with foundational literacy skills often create a barrier for student attainment in ESL and HSE or HSD offerings. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit or, or describe a little bit um, some of the programs that you've seen that are successful in addressing both literacy as well as those program obje objectives? Yeah, one of the things that, uh, you know, sometimes over the years, folks uh, tend to think that we have focused on uh, just serving those at the upper levels. Uh, 
at the expense of not reaching those who have uh, low literacy levels. And if you do that, then you're certainly not building your uh, pipeline for future enrollment opportunities. So um, every student matters. Um, and so developing strategies um, where you can reach those uh, particularly low level of uh, uh, low levels of literacy students um, is incredibly important. And again, it's a, about maybe some of the, the staffing, um, hiring folks that, that have uh, great um, backgrounds uh, in uh, literacy and um, early reading strategies and initiatives, um, but also understanding the importance for those, um, as some as may have described foundational skills um preparing students that are at those very low levels and again there there are uh, uh, programs out there uh, from a software perspective that may be great tools and have also great strategies embedded in software programs um, uh, to be able to do that so uh, there's where you might contact your uh, uh, Aztec uh, folks to talk about uh, ideas and options there yeah, thanks for the shout out. Um, one other question that just came in, uh, people were wondering what the website was for the GED, Pulsar GED Plus. Do you happen to know what that is, that website? Yeah, and and um, GED Plus yeah. org. There we go. Thank you. And I think that's everything on our list here. So thank you for turning to that. So for our, our folks that wanted to know more about that, that program. Um, it looks like we're all good with the questions on the, on the chat. So um, I'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you again, Reese, for, for these three incredible webinars. Uh, we hope to do some more work with you and presentations with you in the future. For sure. For everybody else, thank you so much for joining and we will let you get back to your Wednesday and we hope to look uh, to meet up with you and see you in future presentations.